Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and tonight we've got guest Dr. Mara with us, a doctor of nursing practice and has had an established career in Altoona, Pennsylvania at a location called the Urgent Care Center until July of 30th, 2011. Now, practicing traditional medicine in conjunction with the more holistic approaches, Dr. Mara is also a hypnotherapist, Reiki master, intuitive healer, and spiritual counselor. Basically, he offers a full range of health care and addressing most health concerns, also made it his mission to be of service to all in all areas of body, mind, spirit, which translates to health in its wholeness or holistic health care. Now, we're going to get into a multitude of topics, folks, tonight here at the Leak Project. But one of the first things we're going to discuss is you can probably see this anomaly on the screen here to the top left of the sun. And this video that I'm going to play for you guys here in just a moment is going to make it clearly look like there is a planet X or second sun there. But before we get into that, I first off just want to thank you so much for joining us, Joseph, here at the Leak Project. How the heck are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. It's certainly an honor to speak with you. You've been all over the world in different conferences. I mean, you've just had an amazing life so far, and you're going to do things even more incredible than you have already. So, but what I was hoping we could do first is jump into this video, and I'm going to play it in the background here. Before I do that, just tell us a quick bit about yourself, and then we're going to jump into this video. Okay. Well, you know, as you said, I'm a uh... Uh, my name is Dr. Mara, and I owned uh, and uh, built three urgent care centers. So I practice family medicine. I'm boarded in family medicine. Um, uh, briefly, I also uh, became a hypnotherapist, uh, a Reiki master. I'm also attuned in Sakem Sakem and Moon Aiki, different energy healing modalities. And uh, I always wondered how I could do both because, you know, doing traditional medicine, it, you know, you're only given maybe five to ten, maybe 15 minutes with a patient. And it takes somewhere between a half an hour to an hour to really get in and, and do some quality work with hypnotherapy or energy healing. And so um, what I did was I opened my own practices and half of the building was set up so that the patients had a choice. They could either do traditional medicine or they could do um, what we call alternative or complementary medicine today. And uh, that included hypnotherapy and energy healing. And uh, I also referred people for... Uh, herbal treatments and things like that uh, at a local naturopath. But um, basically, in a nutshell, I, I tried to offer my patients uh, more than just the traditional medicine or what we call traditional medicine today. That's great. I talked to Dr. Len Saputo earlier today, and one of the things I really like about his approach is he takes, he's out there in California, San Francisco Bay Area, and he takes the West, the best of the Western medicine, Eastern cultures, and other type of, you know, opportunities to help his patients and he'll spend an hour or so with them at least just to get to know what's going on in their lives, not just this five, 10 minutes, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, have a wonderful day type scenario. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And, and unfortunately, the way the insurance companies, they tailor your time and they pay so much a visit. And, you know, when you go into to medicine, you think you're there to help the patient and, I, you know, ultimately you are, but you are limited with things such as time and reimbursement because if you're not bringing in enough money to pay for the employees and the lights and everything else, uh, you're not going to be there next week to continue helping them. And so uh, insurances have a lot to do with uh, the way uh, practitioners provide care for their patients these days. Absolutely. Now, if we could, let's jump into this first video that you sent uh, that's about 26 seconds here. And if you could just describe, as I push play here, the, the scenario and the situation. Yeah, so I'm at uh, Lake Glendale in uh, central Pennsylvania. And you can see um, up in the left-hand uh, corner, and, I, and if you play the audio of it later or whatever, I don't know if it's on there right now, but you can hear me saying that there's something up in at the uh, uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock position. And so... As you're capturing it in real time, you can see that. And so what I also did was I'm looking through my phone, and what I did was I tore apart one of those uh, floppy disks. And uh, it has a film there, which uh, it kind of cuts the glare away so that you can actually look towards the sun and see what's around it or uh, within it. And, you know, when I first saw this, I was, like, sold. I thought, oh, my gosh, I captured Planet X. It's here. It's the real deal. I'm actually spinning my phone around so you can see the lens flare that's around there. And so um, after I caught this footage, 
I had to leave the lake for like five minutes and came back. I was so excited and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get the the uh, reflection off the water just like you see there in the sun. We're going to see the second sun with a reflection just like you see on some of these other videos and photos. And what happened was I put this, um, I guess it's iron oxide or magnetic, it's a magnetic disc that you that when you break apart these um, floppy disks. And if you have it a certain distance away from the camera, and this was my iPhone 6 that I was capturing this on, what it does is it creates a second sun. And even though you're spinning it around to see where the lens flare is, it actually created, and the reason I know this is because when I put it up a second time, it was at the 2 o'clock position at this point. And I thought, wait a minute. So I, re I moved it around a little bit again, and I got the, the 11 o'clock position again. And I thought, oh my gosh, this thing is just creating it. And so... I, it would take further research, I'm sure, to see exactly, but that confirmed to me that not everything that we see that's out there on the internet is, I think really, I think people actually think they're capturing things that really aren't there by the tools that they're using, and that, that happened to me personally. That's why I sent that to you is because, you know, not to be a debunker, but I'm neutral on the, on the subject, and I just don't want to be led down this path blindly. I, I would go out and do my own research. And so if there's people out there that are using welding goggles or that same technique that I was using, like breaking apart the floppy disk, um, you know, I couldn't see this with my naked eye. So that's why when I put that up there, I thought, oh my gosh, there it is. And then it just took a second time of me putting the phone down and picking it back up to actually, act, you know, it actually disappointed me in a way, but also I was like relieved that, oh wow, okay, Wow, that sucks that Planet X isn't really there. But then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm glad Planet X isn't really there. You know what I'm saying? I'd be happy that Planet X isn't there. I mean, yeah, right. At first, you're like, oh, right. I can totally understand that. But, you know, and I've been getting a lot of pictures that are similar to this, where you can see this, what looks like a second sun to the top left or to the bottom. And I guess it's just some type of lens anomaly. And I'm going to go here for now. I want to just change the screen and show some sun dogs and stuff like that because we have been getting a lot of images here at the leak project where you've got people with the best intentions and I really hope you guys keep sending us the photos but I just want to show you guys what photos you don't need to send me because they are lens flares or sun dogs or anomalies now this one as you can see right here this is definitely a sun dog and it seems like there's some type of you know light source to the left and right well this is a sun dog you can look it up and then here's another sun dog you can see where it looks like there's this other light source to the left but that's just a reflection from the sun and all the stuff that's being sprayed in the atmosphere all these chemtrails which we're going to talk about here in a little bit and also your expertise because you do fly planes and you've got your own personal plane and you know what the difference is between a contrail and a chemtrail but there's a lot of these anomalies these lens flares and reflections that people think are definitely uh, planet x that i want to show you guys as well because it almost looks like the wing destroyer old icons and logos and stuff that people have seen for many years so what do you think the best way to debunk all of this stuff would be for you joseph i mean if you just wanted to you know say would you recommend people do that what you did with the iron oxide breaking open a floppy disk or something like that and doing the same thing well you know <laughs> this is difficult because it's not just about that you're seeing people with uh better cameras than the iphone 6 you're seeing people with uh uh cameras that have ultraviolet uh, capabilities or infrared capabilities for picking uh, light that we can't see up with the naked eye. And so I've seen some of those pictures that are quite compelling. You see the not only the webcams, uh, you see the satellite cams that are out there in space. Um, you know, there's so much, and, and people are adding all kinds of other things to it, like these underground bunkers that are built. I mean, these are all realities. It's a matter of the cause and effect and what makes sense. And so when you start to research everything, you're like, hmm, Okay, I can get behind some of this, but is that the actual truth? Because going and sifting through the muddy water that's been put out uh, all around us is pretty difficult. So my, my best thing, my best uh, suggestion would be get out and do some of your own research. Uh, don't believe just because one person says it or just a couple people say it. And on the other hand, I'm saying be open-minded because like, like I said, you know, I've witnessed so many things uh, over my lifetime that some people still don't believe, but I'm a true believer because I've personally witnessed and experienced it. So the moment I witness uh, Planet X, I, I can tell you right now I'll be a true believer. But until then, um, I'm not saying I don't believe in it. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm totally open-minded to it and I'm, you know, time will tell. Let's just put it that way. Certainly. Now, this picture that we're looking at right here, this is in your own plane, and you're actually flying over the Rockies? Yeah, I was uh, taking my plane up into Colorado there. I had to get a new uh, 
DG put in it, uh, which is a, a directional gyro, and it uh, it helps you uh, navigate, I guess you could say. And so w instead of just watching the compass the the entire time, you uh, you basically you tune in your DG. What's what's funny though is I had to get a new DG, and just flying my plane recently, it keeps uh, hmm. It's not. How should I put it? I have to change it quite often. And so when you're seeing some of these videos of people talking about the magnetics of the Earth changing, as I'm flying, I can tell you just from a few years ago till now um, how how this has changed in my own plane. And I got a new DG because of it. But uh, you know, there's there's something going on with the magnetics of the Earth, and that's I'm not going to go into detail about it. People can do their own research, but it appears to me that it is. it is. It is, in fact, changing. You know, the other day, I was watching this plane just blast the skies with chemicals, and I was with a friend of mine that's, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. He's, he's well-educated, has a good position in life, you know, not only with just who he is as a person, but also what people would consider a career. And we, we started talking about chemtrails because I was watching this plane just blast the skies, and you could tell what sections of the skies were. You know, they had these clouds that were formed from chemtrails. They're not your typical clouds. They've got this weird haze and, and kind of like reflective pattern to them. And at first he was kind of skeptical. He's like, no, you know, those are, those are just chemtrails or contrails. And, and then we started talking a little bit more, and I convinced him within five minutes because I showed him the proof because after five minutes these things started to dissipate and turn into clouds like I said they would. And he's like, wow, you know what? You're right. So people, are, I think, are even with as much as there's this disassociative mindset where people just don't want to believe or accept it, they're still starting to come out of that and pull their heads out of the sand, I feel. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if you just look up, and you just go back to even when I was a kid and I look up, and, and you know, the blue skies we used to have, and now not only are they they're spraying, but there's like grid work and X's and different kinds of uh, uh, diagrams up there almost. It's, it's almost like there's a pattern to it. And... Uh, they're like independent uh, scientists, biologists. I mean, you can find all kind of documentaries on this now that they have actually tested what's coming out of the air and barium and aluminum and strontium and all kinds of other things that are higher than what they should be. And uh, not to mention that the, the whistleblowers that have come out, people that actually have were pilots that were flying the planes, pictures inside the cabin of the chemicals, pictures of it spraying, and it's not coming out of the engine of the jet, it's actually coming out of nozzles on the uh, wings of the plane. And so you can't even deny it. If you are open enough to look into it, you'll prove to yourself. That's, that's what happens to a lot of debunkers. They'll go out there and they'll be like, this is a bunch of BS and I'm going to prove it. They prove it to themselves that, holy crap, this is, this is a reality. Absolutely. And one thing that I guess I should say about Planet X that makes me think it might be there even more than the pictures that I see are all of the trolls and people that I can clearly tell are not just those that are trying to stir the pot in a jokingly manner, like people that are actually professionals, you know, they're good with psychology. You can tell by the way that they respond to certain individuals, and then they'll push specific buttons to get reactions out of these people so that they can use it against them. And that's one thing that makes me think Planet X is more real than anything, because I remember chemtrails 10, 15 years ago, when somebody would come out and say that they're they're real. I mean, just the trolls were blasting them left and right from every aspect. And I know that there's a lot of people that just come up and, and make comments on the internet and don't agree with it. And I think that that's great. I think it's very healthy to have an alternative view. So I'm all for constructive criticism and different points of view. But when you come out and you just swear at somebody, all caps, raise, you know, coming up with stuff that doesn't even matter, or you don't listen to anything somebody has to say, you just read a title and then you start attacking that person based upon, you know, a couple of words. It's just, it doesn't make any sense except for that person is probably a professional that gets paid by specific organizations to come out and do that stuff and create disinformation. Yeah, you know, I agree. And, and to uh, also add one more uh, aspect to this is I think that CERN plays a role in what's going on right now with what some people are calling the elites or the Illuminati or the powers that be or whatever you want to call it. Um, I have a theory about that, the, the CERN, which we can get into a little bit later. I know we're on the subject of uh, chemtrails, but I think I think that HARP, I think that um, the chemtrails, I think that this CERN uh, technology that they're creating, I have a totally different take on what, what's going on with CERN. I, I think that it's a multi-level reason why they're, they're, they're using it and what they're trying to accomplish with it. But I think it has, if, if we're going to get into the Nibiru talk, I have a theory about what 
what the CERN, I haven't heard anybody else theorize this, but I'm going to bring it out on your show tonight, and you can tell me what you think about it. You heard and it here we, first, folks, Leak Project. <laughs> Whether it's accurate or not, it's just a theory. It's just, uh, I, you know, uh, we can talk about it whenever you want to, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody knows what chemtrails are, and CERN is very important, so that'd be great. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, do you want me to talk about it now? It's basic. It's just a basic theory. And yeah. then Okay, so as you as you watch the mm, the magnetic field of the Earth when CERN gets turned on, you can see how the magnetic field dissipates the whole way back to almost where the satellites are revolving around the uh, the Earth. And so I'm sitting there thinking one day, I'm like, hmm. Okay, so if you're at a junkyard, the old style magnets, these great big magnets that would lift up the car and it would put it into the crusher and then to release, you know, it's almost like there's a switch that shuts it off, whether it be electromagnetic, it turns it on, turns it off. I'm wondering, I'm sitting there wondering, I wonder if CERN has anything to do with uh, shutting off the magnetics of the planet so when Nibiru passes by, it doesn't spin us with a, a huge um, uh, pole shift because even though these bunkers are are set up for all these uh, asteroids or whatever's going to be comets, whatever's going to be coming in. On one side of the Earth, where a lot of these bunkers would be, it would be safer to be on the opposite side of where those uh, impact spots would be. And the pole shift itself is going to, the whole uh, oceans, you know, I mean, they're going to be shifting and moving. The mountains are going to be uh, moving, uh, you know, upward, creating mountains, I'm sure. And so, why? To me, it seems like it would be a plausible theory to think that, boy, as Nibiru and uh, this iron oxide and this huge iron magnetic planet that would be coming by, which would spin us or, or make us shift in poles, if they could prevent that, wouldn't they have a better chance of living it through, living out the, uh, uh, a, a, uh, a Nibiru by, or, uh, passerby? That's my theory. That's a good theory as well. I've often thought it might be used to create some type of black hole technology for weaponized things also. Who knows? I mean, there could be multiple levels there. There usually is when you have that kind of money and brain power and backing into something. So it's pretty cool tech. Now, one thing also that I was hoping we could do is I wanted to show this video of you picking up the, uh, you know, your version of the Phoenix Lights here. This is really cool. So is that showing up on the screen? Yeah, yeah, okay. it looks good. All right, well, I'm going to hit play here, and if you kind of want to walk us through this, that'd be fantastic. Do you want to hear the video as you play it, or do you want me to talk through it? Talk through it if you would. All right, so as uh, my friend Terry and I, we traveled to Phoenix just to capture these Phoenix lights, and she's walking past this bay window, which is off to her left shoulder, and she looks out the window, and she says, there they are. I grabbed my camera, ran out, and there they were. I, th I couldn't believe it. That's the whole reason why we went. And what was the chances of, of us being there? So what you can see in the left corner above the left uh, orb, if you will, is a blinking light. It's a helicopter. And so it sh gives you size to how big these things really were. And it started out being like five of them. Then it went to three by the time I got out there. And they're pulsing in and out different colors. And um, then eventually they all faded out and were gone. And I have like a minute and 47 seconds worth of it. But... If you hear my voice, I'm really excited. I'm shaking around at the camera. It wasn't because I was scared. I was so excited that there they were, and then my focus wouldn't work, and I just wasn't prepared for to, to capture something like this. It was so exciting. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's some amazing footage right there. I'm looking at these things, and they seem to be humongous compared to that helicopter, I would say, at least eight or nine times the size, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely, and then the brilliance of the light, too. It was just, they were so bright. I was like, wow, this is just... It was just an amazing event. I, I mean, I have lots of stories from all the places I've been, but this is one of one of my favorites. What type of camera were you using, and what, where exactly was this? Well, you know what? I think it was a JVC. It was a camcorder, and you know what? It's this. This was back a few years ago. So, um, forgive me for not knowing the exact details, but this was at Cynthia Crawford's house. She's, if you look, if you Google her name, she uh, is a sculptor. And she sculpts ETs that she's been in contact with. And so when I heard about the Phoenix Lights and I heard about her, my friend Terry and I, we used to travel the country just to, to meet people and go to places like the East City Ranch and different places just, just to experience it and see what, you know, is this for real? Each place that we went, is this a real deal? And so um, it was at her house, and the backdrop to her house is called Superstition Mountain. And so it was, if anybody wants to, you know, map quest it or Google it or whatever you want to do to find it, her house is right in front of it, and then beyond that is the those lights you see below the um, 
the orbs is the phoenix lights, or actually phoenix below. And yeah, so, okay, there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. so that's the city of Phoenix, and of course above it is these great big orbs, and there they were. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I got and and I got it. I'm like, wow, not too many people have had the opportunity to not only witness these, but to capture it on their own camera. I mean, they look like the size of the lights down in the city, you know? I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Right, and, and how bright they are. And, and the other thing, um, closer to the time I captured these, it was a few years after, I guess, but there's a gentleman, um, uh, if you just Google UFO AM, it was the program, and he interviewed me, so I had more of the specifics. I sent him the information, and he wanted to know the camera, and so I had to look it all up. So if you, you're asking me what the camera was and all that, I mean, that's a good way if you really want to go back um, to find out the specifics. It was a 30-minute program. It was, it's on YouTube. You could Google it. And uh, so if you want more specifics, you could check there. Wonderful. Now, what I'd like to do next, if we could, is you have a really nice presentation that you put together for, didn't you say, the SETI Ranch? Uh, actually, it was for uh, Mount Shasta. Conference. Oh, Mount Shasta. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. And so you've only, you, not a whole lot of people have seen this, and I had an opportunity to look at it before we started the show here. I was wondering if you could share that with us, and we could talk about some of your experiences and encounters that you've had. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, if I can bring that up here. Mm -hmm. Let me just turn this off here. Yeah, this is great. That's some really good footage. I mean, that is so cool. <laughs> I had a guy on the other day, Mark Rosenhoff, and this guy lives out in New York City, and he films these just amazing anomalies in the sky. He, he talks about contact and everything else, and this one that he filmed out in New York City was this giant gold-looking wishbone UFO. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. that's You know, it's funny because I've seen orbs. I've seen the cigar-shaped ones. I've seen the discs. I've seen what people are calling cloud chips. And I'm in New Mexico, and these things were just, as I'm communicating, if you want to call it telepathically, I'm just kind of talking in my head to them like, hey, you know, I see you basically, and just communicating like that. They're all of a sudden, they're fading in and out, the same exact size in the same exact place. There's no other clouds in the sky, but they look exactly, they're shaped like a disc, but they look like a cloud. But they're fading in and out. And I'm like, this is, and I didn't get any footage of that. I didn't have my camera. And sometimes I'm glad I don't have it because it takes away from the experience. It's like I'm in this moment, and I can't wait to get my camera, and it kind of ruins it. So sometimes I'm glad that I didn't have my camera. Uh, but, yeah, I've seen various um, shapes and sizes of these UFOs. And, uh, yeah, for people that haven't seen them, you've got to be open-minded to it. And sometimes if you're at a, a place uh, like Sedona or Mount Shasta, there are just certain places on the planet that have a higher energy. And as you're standing there, you mm, you start to vibrate with that frequency of the planet at that time, and it widens your abilities and your um, and your intuition, all kinds of stuff, which we can get into here in a little bit. Great. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. The pineal gland seems to be so important to kind of get to that sixth sense enhancement. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And, and so, you know what? Uh, can you see the... Um, I can see the screen. Now, the only thing that I would recommend is you can actually close out that, uh, that box there that says Leaf Project. I think you can just click that and click the X button there. It's not going to disconnect us or anything. Oh, okay. And, yeah, okay, perfect. Awesome. So, that's, that's what I was afraid of. It was going <laughs> to shut us, shut us down. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good to go, man. This is so bridging the gap. Yeah, so basically I put this together just mm, – it's nothing jaw-dropping or anything like that. It's just more mind-inspiring. It, it's thought-provoking. It's like, hmm, yeah, I hadn't thought of that in that way. And so I'm not really an expert in, in, in you know, a lot of this. It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm trained in uh, my degrees, my associate, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. They're all in science. And so, you know, um, a lot of the research that I've done has been on my own, and I don't claim to be an expert by any means, but, you know, if you gather anything out of this, it's all about asking a question like what if and, and what – does that even make sense? And then do a little bit of research to try to debunk it. And whenever you do that, sometimes you debunk it, but sometimes you actually prove that, holy crap, this is like for real. And so if we kind of dig into this here, I kind of already gave you my background, but what's important was I was born and raised a Catholic. And if you stay in like a religious framework, a, a box, so to speak – Sometimes you can't be open-minded to some of these other possibilities because of what you've been taught or trained. And this, this comes from your parents. It comes from, you know, um, the religions that you're born into. And so one of the things that never made sense to me was, like, if there's somebody that's born on the other side of the planet, and it's, say it's a baby, and they don't have any chance to grow up and, and like, 
research and, and find out is the religion that I'm in the, the wrong one or the right one, if they die and they go to hell, that, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me, but that's what my religion was teaching me. And, and so when you'd question about it, it was like, well, you know, ignorance is no excuse and all these other things, and it just didn't make sense to me. And so yeah, they told you they want you to be ignorant because ignorance is bliss. Well, <laughs> for sure. And, but, you know, it keeps you in a box. And so what I'm saying is even if you're Christian, if you're Catholic, if you're whatever, just be open-minded and allow yourself to step out to, to um, prove it to yourself. And, you know, my religion, that, the religion I was involved in back then, the Catholicism, you weren't allowed to go outside. It was a sin. And, and you know, you're always, you were taught to uh, bring your fellow man to your religion, the one true faith. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time because it makes a lot of people angry when you start talking about religion. Hey, that's my religion. And you know, you know what? I'm, I'm not dissing any religion, but I can talk about it because I was Christian. I was Catholic. And as I stepped out of it and did this research and allowed myself, I have a whole new perspective of life and what's going on on the planet. And it's not right for everybody. So again, I'm not pushing anything on anybody, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know what? You might want to be a little bit more open-minded. And so... Go ahead, Rex. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, absolutely. And that's the cool thing about the Leak Project is we have very astute listeners from all walks of life, different religions, you know, different spiritual beliefs, some people that are agnostic, atheists, you know, Christians, Muslims, people that practice different forms of hermetics and, and everything in between. So I feel that whatever your path is, if it's really your intentions, what you do, that is who you are. It's what you've done that makes you what you are. And if you have a different belief on what your God is, fantastic. You know, I mean, that's that's wonderful. So I don't think if I, I get so many comments that there's others that just don't know how to express themselves. And because they've kind of been confined within certain things, they'll come out with attacks because of their fundamental beliefs. And hey, I mean, that's cool, too. I mean, you've got the freedom to say what you want to. And I myself was raised Christian, and I think that they are amazing people, and the, the Christ archetype, whether Christ is real, described in the Holy Bible or not, is certainly an incredible uh, way of thinking. You know, I mean, why not help others? Uh, you know, whoever has not sinned, cast the first stone. Treat others as yourself. What's wrong with that? Those are golden rules. Yeah, absolutely. He also said that uh, you will do these things and greater things. And so he's talking about humanity, and what I think— um, what if he was real? Because some people don't believe that he was real. But you know what? Like you said, why not listen to some of these teachings? Because it's all positive teachings to me. But if you can get behind the fact that he was talking to humanity, trying to teach us our highest potential, rather than following him as God, I don't really think that that was his message. Now, that's my interpretation of it. Now, you know, I was, like I said, I was born and raised Catholic, and it goes against everything we've been taught. But I really think he was teaching us our highest potential. And so... You know, if you do what he does or similar to what he does, you can do exactly. He even said it. He said, you'll do these things and greater things. And so I really think that those that are mm, not Christian, those that are Christian, those that are uh, atheists, um, different people from different parts of the world, from different walks of life are all pieces to this puzzle. Because some of us have come here to play the opposition. And that's what I'll get into later is that we're all equal in the eyes of God. And so some of us have come here to play the bad guy. Some of us have come to play the good guy. It's all part of this, this the, the, grander, the grander plan, so to speak. Yeah, and so what is Reiki? Reiki energy. Okay, so if you would Google it, it's actually um, it's an energy healing. And so it talks about chakras. There's seven major chakras. But as you dig into this, you find out, and you go into other energy healing modalities, you find out that uh, there are many, many, many more um, of these uh, chakra centers. And so what, it, what you do is, um, as you become attuned, which traditionally is um, getting a attunement or an energy that's passed down from a master down to the student, and then the student becomes the master, and then so on and so forth. But really, everybody on the planet, if you're in human form, you are an energy healer. All you have to do is believe in yourself. And, and you know, I think the Reiki has its place. It's, it's a starting or a stepping stone. And once you learn about it and you can focus your intent and you understand what's behind it, it's healing. But really, you are, as the Reiki master or the energy healer, you are um, used as a conduit to funnel energy. Because I wrote it, what I believe is we're all um, receivers and transmitters of all kinds of things, information, energy, consciousness, whatever. And so as you lay your hands on an individual, like if you want to go back to Jesus, how he healed people, it's the same thing. And so... He, he was an energy healer, and so that's what Reiki energy, but it's one modality. And so as I branched out, 
I actually got attuned in many other ones. And so now I just call upon the highest sources of creation when I'm doing heal healing work because if you call them one modality like Reiki or one modality like uh, Sakem Sakem, um, that's what you're pulling in. But if you become the true um, mm, receiver and then transmitter, you just ask whatever's in the greatest good of this patient or this person, and that's what comes through you and whatever's in their greatest good. That's what I've learned over the years of practicing it. And I guess everybody probably knows what hypnotherapy is. And um, also, uh, you know, I, my background is in traditional medicine. I'm boarded in family medicine. I had a near-death experience in college, and that's a whole other story. So, what was that like? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I'm coming around a, a, a curve, and it was in the middle of winter. I live in central Pennsylvania, and so it was, uh, it was icy, and it was black ice is what we hit. And there was two other guys that was with us. Uh, with me, and I come around the corner, and I, you know, I'll slid right off the road into the grass, and the next thing, I'm heading straight for this solid block wall, this garage. We went through it, pushed his pickup truck out the back end of this garage, and uh, when you, if you would see the pictures, I should have sent you those pictures, but it, the whole cab was crushed down to the steering wheel, so all of, all three of us should have been dead, but we all walked out of it, and in the moment when we, when we hit the grass, it was like no time. I had time to think about, speaking of time, I, I mean, I thought about the day. I'm, I'm saying a prayer in, in, as we're heading towards that wall. I'm like, God, please don't take these. T this isn't their fault. This is my responsibility. If you're going to take someone, take me. And in the same breath, I was saying, please don't take me. I have more to do here. You know, I'm just getting into helping humanity, and I know that I have more here to do. And I didn't see the white light or anything like that. I did have that impact. And so what many people talk about the NDE is the, the white light, but there's two that I've experienced one of those two. And one is a major impact which transforms your DNA over a 10-year period. You have this leap of uh, mm, evolution, if you will, in consciousness especially. And so that's what happened to me. It was in 98, and by the year uh, 2008, I was like full on awake and all this wisdom was coming from, I don't, you know, just uh, any, uh, from the high sources of creation is the best way that I could say it. I don't know where it came from. Now, after you had that experience, did it kind of change your whole mindset on everything? Well, you know, huh, let me think about it. In the, in the moments right after, of course, I was the same. It was... It was a shock to the system, and but all of a sudden I started knowing things, and it was I, the best way I can say is it, is it was an acceleration of wisdom, understanding, um, openness to other things. Because at that time, I, up till that particular point in my life, like I said, I was born and raised Catholic, and even though I questioned everything, I was still going to church. In fact, that night I I was uh, the Eucharistic minister. I took the gifts up, and you know all these things, and that. From that point on, it totally changed my life. So yes, it was a—I uh, mean, it was within a, uh, a couple weeks, but weeks to months turned into years of me just having this. Oh my gosh, I just—I couldn't get enough information. That's why I was traveling all over the the United States and other countries to find out what the truth was. I needed the truth. It was, it was, it was such a drive. I can't even explain it. And so, when we're talking about me becoming a hypnotherapy and a Reiki master. You know, I was saying to myself, how can I do this and practice traditional medicine? I can't do both. And all of a sudden, this lady walks into my office. She hands the receptionist a card. She was a hypnotherapist and a Reiki master. I, I just couldn't even believe it. All of a sudden, all these synchronistic events started happening to me since that near-death experience. That I, I mean, it just totally changed my life. It just was. If I, if I look back, it's just amazing. Um, everything that happened and unfolded to allow me to wake up to the truth of what's going on on this planet. And, now, I was just going to say, I'd, go ahead, please finish. Well, I, the only thing I wanted to add to that is this woman that walked into my life, um, she would do things, she would do a thing called automatic channeling or automatic writing. And she just busted into it one time or two times and didn't realize what was going on. She was just, she was kind of like half asleep and she started writing something. And the next thing you know, she wakes up like an hour later and has this writing in different penmanship than hers and information that she didn't know where it came from. And as soon as she told me that, I was like, oh my gosh, we have to explore this because the scientist in me wanted to know where it came from. And before long, it was like, by the way, I hired this lady to do the hypnotherapy and Reiki for me. And we start doing this automatic writing, which turned into channeling. Uh, and we went through all these phases of channeling from 
the astral realm to the angelic realm to the ET realm to channeling planets. I mean, it's it's so bizarre that people that are listening to this, I mean, if they're listening to your show, I'm guessing they're open to hear this. Um, there are some tricksters along the way, so people that aren't giving the accurate information uh, that are channelers, they're stuck or they're at a particular level of channeling. But as you bust through all that, you go to these higher realms of uh, understanding and wisdom, and you raise your vibration to a point where you don't tap into or tune into. It's like kind of changing the dial on your, your radio or your TV. You don't tune into that frequency anymore. You're at these higher uh, frequencies, and that's you get the most accurate information when you raise your vibration. And so you have to get rid of a lot of baggage and uh, a lot of crap, basically. you got to step out of the 3D world and, and actually be open-minded. And then you become more service to others rather than service to self. You become less selfish. You're, 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 you're in it for the planet, and you're in it for the people, and, and you have compassion for people. And these are the things that happened to me during this growth period. Well, that's really cool, and that actually answered my question because I was going to ask you about the daily channeling, so you brought some of that up. And that's interesting because I've read a book by Franz Barr, and he passed away many years ago, but one of the most amazing minds of all time in regards to hermetics. I mean, this guy could just do things that people would say, that is inc- that is impossible. There's no way that could be done. Well, he, he could do those kind of things, and actually Hitler uh, kidnapped him during the war because he wanted to take his abilities and use it to help win the war. So just an incredible, remarkable person. But when he talks about doing these different channeling type things, he doesn't call it channeling, but connecting consciousness with different planets, planetary bodies, and energies associated with those and what you can get back from it. So talk to us about some of these channelings that you've had. Oh my goodness, there's so many. We, and we've tuned into so many um, species or consciousnesses, if you will, if that's a word. It, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, it's, uh, each one has a particular vibration and you can feel it. If you're sensitive, as you close your eyes even, you know who's coming through. It, it's so strange. It's like, like I'll be closing my eyes and I'll be like, oh wow, and I'll say to myself, These are, this is an archangel coming through. And all of a sudden, this is Archangel Gabriel, or this is Archangel Michael, or and then you're like, oh, it's the Arcturians that are coming through, and or or you'll close your eyes and you'll see this purple, purplish hue, and you'll know it's the uh, Arcturians, and in your mind's eye you can see their figure, their the ones I'm talking about, like the Andromedans or the Arcturians, the ones that we tuned into have a humanoid figure, and they're they're human-like, but they have, like for instance, the Andromedans, what we who we tuned into were they were Hmm. If you were to touch a dolphin, their skin, no hair, all soft, uh, mm, that's what the Adramans, they have a bluish hue to them, or blue, blue like, uh, and they're very large, they're tall, they're loving, they're, the energies are just amazing. When you're doing energy healing and you bring them through, oh my, it, it's like a whole other level of, of energy healing. And so, um, yeah, we, like I said, we went from the astral realm, which wasn't so pleasant, and then we, we moved up into the, Ar- the archangel realm. And, then, and each one of these are belief systems. And so what we had to learn along the way was that where you are on your consciousness and what you're willing to believe in and be open to, that's why people that are in a religious state, they can get behind archangels because they're in the Bible, in a book that they've learned about. But they can't get behind extraterrestrials because, you know, of course, that's taboo. And, you know, you're, you're crazy if you start talking about ETs and all these other things. People don't want to be ridiculed. And, and, and plus in, in, in Catholicism, you're taught that if you – Step into any of this stuff. It's demonic. You're it's born all... in hell. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. You're going to burn in hell. So you're scared to death to do it. So do it. they use fear to control us, basically. They separate us. They control us that way. And... So anyway, that's just in a nutshell, the channeling. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on about – but basically what it felt like to me was Terry Ippoletti her name. And you can Google her. She, she still practices today. Uh, she was like Edgar Casey to me. She would lay down on the, the Reiki table, and we'd start doing energy healing, and the next thing you know, bam, something would pop out. And she'd start talking all this information that wasn't in her voice. It wasn't the information or the words that she used. I was recording a lot of it uh, when we first started, and then it got to be to the point where you know, I didn't want to have to grab my camera or the, the, um, the recorder. I wanted to tune in and listen to it and get the wisdom that these beings were saying because it was so, uh, so important to my growth. And recently we've been channeling, so I got some recent information too about what's going on on the planet, some of which I will talk about, some of which I won't because, you know, depending on what level you're at, some people go into fear mode and, you know, it's, it, who does it serve if you start talking about things that people are afraid of? So I think we can handle it. <laughs> hey. 
can we've you got our big boy pants on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can handle the truth here. This is Leak Project, man. All right. Well, we'll get into it here in a little bit. So anyway, once I found all this information out, I'm like, and I'm traveling the world or the globe here, and I'm like, okay, I got all this information. Who am I going to talk to? As soon as I tried to talk to my family or my parents, they're like, what? <laughs> like, you have lost your mind. Did you bump your head whenever you had that <laughs> automobile accident? Right? That's what it was like. What's up and in so, the air up there? <laughs> you flying that plane. What are they doing to you, son? Right. So it, it's, yeah, it, it's quite comical because, you know, I maintain a practice now and I made it through all this education and, you know, um, I'm You're quite You're a doctor. Sane. You're not a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> well, that's debatable. So the things I talk about, you know, you're like, wow. Some people say, do you know any doctors like you in my area? And then there are other people that are like, oh, man, this guy is way out there. Like, wow, my God, I can't believe he's practicing. You know, so anyway, you learn all this information out. You're like, who do you talk to? So I created this uh, radio talk show called Universal Talk. And I started interviewing people all over the planet and, you know, to get this, to create a platform, kind of like what you're doing here. And then I started traveling and I was doing things in real time and putting it up on YouTube. You know, I'd video it and I'd go to Chaco Canyon in uh, New Mexico. And Love the it vibrations. out there. Oh my God, it's just, it's ridiculously beautiful. The energies are there. You can see them shift. I'm seeing it with my naked eye. And if you look at under my YouTube page, you'll see it under uh, Chaco Canyon. I'm saying, oh my God, the energy just shifted. The colors changed right before. And then I looked down at my camera and it did it right on the camera. It, I picked it up. I caught it. I was like, oh my God, I actually captured that. So when I was talking earlier about some places have a higher energy and a higher frequency and you're tuning into it, I actually captured what I was talking about on my camcorder. And so, anyway, um, the Universal Talk radio show, I did that for a while. I started lecturing. I wanted to be on the other side of the mic because I started learning so much information. I just wanted to put it all together and, and show people, like, hey, look, be open-minded because there's so much more out there that you're missing. And it was exciting to me. And then later, I developed another radio show called uh, A Guiding Light, and I did that for a while. And over the past few years here, I just kind of you know, took a break in the whole thing because I got to this point where I was flooded with the information and trying to teach people and not everybody was ready to hear it at that time and and I think I just needed a break for myself and so you know, I appreciate you having me on to allow me to express some of this information that I think a lot of people are ready to hear right now. Oh, I certainly appreciate you coming on the show. I mean, it's an honor to have you here. A few years ago, I worked for a Fortune 100 company, you know, very big business and, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation, was with them for seven years. Get to where I was just talking so much about what was going on that one of the big head honchos, actually one of the regional managers over many other managers, et cetera, said, hey, you know, you need to cool off, quit talking about this so much. And one of my coworkers said, you know what you should do, Rex, is you should start a radio show. And I was like, you know what? I think you're right. So it's funny because these, these shows are really, for people like yourself and me also, this gives us an opportunity to, it's almost like we feel like we have to do this. Even if we can't, if, even if we got a life somewhere else, making a, a living, doing something else, this kind of stuff, it takes so much time. And like you said, it, your parents and your friends look at you like you're crazy. So you ostracize yourself in so many different ways, yet we continue to do it. And it's not for the money. I mean, it's because it's, it's almost like it's our life path. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, if I didn't have uh, the my own urgent care centers and w which funded the whole uh, endeavor of us going all over the place, and uh, like I said, I paid for myself and my friend Terry to go with me. She was my Edgar Casey, and I, she had to go with me to you know if we're gonna have an awesome experience, I had to have my psychic, uh, my uh, channeler, my whatever friend you want to call her. I mean, she's quite awesome, and so. Um, yeah, if I didn't have my own place, I couldn't have taken off when I wanted to take off. I couldn't have been able to afford it. Um, and it wasn't like we'd go for months at a time. We would just take a weekend trip and we'd go somewhere for like three or four days and pay back to it. And then until the next thing come up. And it was like, and I'm always researching. I'm like, oh, we got to go see this person. We got to go to the East Eddy Ranch. We got to go here. We got to go there. And so, I mean, what's weird is all the things that some of the people get to experience. And I'm saying some. And I think it has to do with people being open minded to it. Um, I actually got to witness a lot of these things, uh, you know, the sounds that people were hearing here a couple years ago, and even more recently, it sounds like this metallic trumpet sound, uh, in, and it, you can't pinpoint it, it's like so loud, it's in the airway somewhere, you're looking at the skies going, oh my god, it's, almost, it's so eerie, where is that coming from, is it the earth that's moaning and groaning, is it an ET ship that's above us, that's cloaked that you can't see, like what, then you look, because of course I was born and raised Catholic, you, you think about the biblical sense, like, 
oh, and the sixth or seventh trumpet sounded or, you know, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, is this biblical? Like, what the heck is going on here? Absolutely. And I said I thought that sound was more like War of the Worlds, you know, <laughs> um, in, the, in the TV show or the, the movie. Just the... Right. And you, I never heard it personally except for on YouTube and stuff like that. That must have made the hair stand up on your I, arms. I can't even explain. I'm telling you right now, I was freaked out at my arms, my back and my... I'm like, and I'm looking around. I'm like, what the heck is that? That is so freaky. It's one thing to see it on YouTube and go, wow, that's really weird. But when you're in the moment, you're like, whoa. That's that's really, really, yeah. And plus the ghosts and all the other things I witnessed in Gettysburg. I mean, there's a lot of things that made my, my, my hair stand up. Oh, and, what was uh, that like? Oh, man, it's it, seeing some of the, uh, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you one example. My friend Terry and I were sitting in the basement of the Farnworth, Farnsworth Inn. It's, it was considered uh, one of, if not the most haunted place in America, in Gettysburg. And it's a, it's a bed and breakfast, it's a restaurant, and it goes way back. And so we're in the basement with a bunch of other people, and I'm sitting next to my friend Terry, and she's nudging me, looking at me. It's pitch black in there, and this, the person that was doing the tour was in the corner just talking, you know, and telling us about what's going on with the Farnsworth. And she's like, can't you see that little – do you see this little kid? And I'm like, what little kid? And meanwhile, we're all facing the head. This little kid was sitting on the wall that was probably about three or four feet in front of us, had his legs crossed and just swinging. And she's like, he's dressed in blue. You don't see that kid right there. I'm like, I don't see anybody. Like, what are you talking? And so she was so compelled. She stopped the guy that was given the tour and says, um, "Do you guys see this little kid right here?" Like it was so real to her. And everybody was looking at each other, going, "What?" And he said, "Describe this little boy." So she described him, like what he was wearing, what do you, you know? And and the guy's like, "Okay, so that is so and so." I can't remember the kid's name, but. He was the, the, one of the kids that I was just going to tell you about that is, when the people stay in the bed and breakfast, he's the one that plays tricks on everybody. His name is this, and the, that's what he's dressed like. It's exa- he, was like he was freaked out because she was so accurate about what this kid looked like. And, I, I'm, and then while we're sitting there, and this is going to give me chills right now. It's like ugh, way back in the back corner of this place on the left-hand side, and we were to the right, this <sighs> mean voice, that's all I'm going to say on the air is like, uh, I mean, it was growling and talking, and everybody was freaked out. You could hear everybody's chairs screeching and moving and standing up going, what was that? What was that? And we all heard it. We're, and you turn the lights on, there's nothing there. And so talk about hair standing on the back of your – oh, God, that, that was a freaky moment that, that – yeah, I mean, now I'm, I'm a little more evolved where it doesn't freak me as much. But if I take myself back to that moment, oh, man. Yeah, I've had some really yeah, hair-raising experiences, you could say. Now, when you were at the ranch out in Mount Hood, you've met James then, obviously. Oh, yeah, Mount, Ad- or, uh, yeah, Mount Adams. Yeah, Mount Adams, on, I, the, I apologize. No, yeah, that's right. It's, it's because there's like Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Hood, Mount uh, Adams are all right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to live in the Northwest, so I, I should know that. <laughs> I used to go biking all the time out there in Sunrise and Paradise in Mount Rainier, just a great place to, to go ride. But So when you were out there, did you see some just insane anomalies? I mean, was it? Did it deliver? <laughs> oh, my. When we were there, abs- within the first 15 minutes, it, it started getting dark, and then everybody started walking out to the field uh, there at the ranch. And as it got darker and darker, all of a sudden, these UFOs started showing up. And I can't even tell you how many we saw the first 15 to 30 minutes. It was ridiculous. And they were coming. They were huge, just kind of like that, the, the video I showed you. But they were closer to us, and they were just above the tree line. And when they would power up, they would come across. It would look like a star coming towards you. Like it was in the distance, and all of a sudden it was right there, and it would power up. And it would be so bright. And you're like, because they were communicating with us. And again, we're at a higher vibration, and everybody there was seeing these. We caught it on night vision. Um, we actually watched some uh, fighter jets go towards these things, two of them, and you'd see them dispatch, and all of a sudden, they're like, shh, and all of a sudden, the UFO would blink out, the F-15, 6-14s, whatever they are, blew by, and all of a sudden, boop, back on. We were laughing because they were messing with these, these guys flying the, these jets, and uh, we saw pixies. Beautiful, like, man. I'm telling you, we saw these little pixies that were flying. They're about two inches high, right across your vision. And, and you're looking at them going, this can't be real, and you have the camera going with night vision, and you capture it on, on film. And so there, it was, like I said, things in synchronicity. Me and my friend Terry were there. We happened to show up on a day that they were doing a documentary. So we ended up in the documentary. So you could Google that, too. And the map makers was the crew that did this documentary. And so it was you know, the East Eddie Ranch documentary and the map makers. If you YouTube that, you'll find it. And there's little clips of it. And so there's all kind of stuff you'll see that we captured. 
Oh man. And then that's awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah, we were there doing this energy work. We all got into this circle. And you know, we were there as students because they were doing some teaching there and we learned a lot. And I was just so compelled to share Terry's gift to the people in the room that I said, okay, look, I don't want to talk out of turn here, but I really think that you guys are going to appreciate this. And, and I told them that she channels and all this. And I said, look, I, well, I'm not going to force it upon you or anything, but I just, if the group would be open to this, and I'm talking to the two instructors that were there, um, and they, were, they, they looked at each other and said, yeah, sure, okay, let's raise the vibration of the place. And so I did a meditation for everybody, rose the, you know, we were rise, making the vibration of the place rise. And all of a sudden, one of the teachers, there was a male and a female, the female said, she, well, you know, most people had their eyes closed. She goes, oh, wow, it's the Andromedans coming through. And she, it, it, within a second, Terry's like, we are the Andromedans or something. like. And it was like mind-bending. Everybody's looking at each other going, oh, my God. Just because the girl felt the energy of the Andromedans who were coming through, other people were saying, do you hear that? Do you hear that tone? And uh, some of the people in the room could hear it and other people couldn't. They're like, that ringing, that buzz, that... Here it was the ship that was above the ranch that was making this this tone that some people could hear and some people couldn't. And so as Terry was channeling the Andromedans that came through, she was explaining all this to us. It was just – so when you say did it deliver, yeah, absolutely. And when I went to leave, this was probably one of the scariest moments of my entire life. So it's 1 o'clock in the morning. I knew I had to get up in about four hours to catch the plane, right? And so I go out there by myself in the middle of the field with my little droid cell phone lighting the way out to the field, meandering out there. And I thought, I'm going to get my own personal experience. Maybe they'll take me up there. Who knows? You know, maybe I'll see something. So I'm right. in the middle of this. Yeah. So I'm in the middle of this field, right? And I'm looking. It's beautiful out. And it was quite chilly, too. As I'm looking up and I'm seeing all these stars. I'm going, oh my God, this is just breathtaking and gorgeous. And oh my God. And I was a little disappointed because nothing happened in the sky, right? So I was like, oh, well, you know. The last few days were amazing, and you know what? I'm going to stay positive, and even though I didn't have my personal experience, just as soon as I said that, I heard boom, 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 coming. I thought it was coming towards me. I thought it was, it was a giant, whatever it was. I thought it was – first thing I thought it was Bigfoot. I thought, oh, my God, this thing's going to grab me and take me out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's all I could think. Here it was running away from me. As I was walking with my cell phone, and like I said, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. I, this thing was running, it, and I'm telling you, it was bipedal, and you know, I used to hunt, so I know, and I used to, I grew up on a farm, so I know what things that sound like, like an elk, or what deer sound like, a horse, a cow, this was bipedal, and this thing was huge, as loud as it was, and so, the next day, when I asked James about it, he told me that most likely it was a Bigfoot, because they see them all the time up there, and so people that say that Bigfoots don't exist, in the area, people seem to see them up in, in, in Washington, and in Oregon, so it's, it's common to them. Well, it's a perfect place for them because if anybody's ever explored the Northwest, I mean, the forests and mountains are vast, and there's so much food source out there, whether it's close to the water or inland because of all the rain and vegetation. A great place to hide out, too. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I didn't get to physically see it. The only thing I could go by was what I heard. And so I didn't see any footprints. It was pitch black out. So, um, you remember Harry and the Hendersons? Yes, absolutely. That's, Harry. What I could, yeah. <laughs> that's what I could picture. But you know what? If I'm being honest, this thing sounded even louder. Like this thing sounded like it was 50 foot tall and thousands of pounds. Like I'm telling you, it was I, I never experienced anything like it. And because we were at Mount Adams, to me, it, because of the, the dimensions and, that were shifting where we were at, because of the high vibration where we were at and the people were, that were there and what we were doing, raising the vibration and, and we were meditating and all the things we were doing, I wouldn't be surprised if it was – you know, ET from a higher dimension that shifted in or something like that. So I'm just putting it out there. I didn't see anything. I don't know exactly what it was. It could have been a Bigfoot, but people that don't believe in Bigfoot, what was it? I don't know. It was bipedal, it was loud, and it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> you know, if you would have heard those trumpets at the same time, like we talked about earlier, the War of the World trumpets, then that could have been that machine that was out there zapping people with that laser that was about two stories tall. You know, that, that could have been... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I, we wouldn't be talking right now. I probably would have just checked out right there. That was going on. You're like, man, I am going to get out of the, uh, the conspiracy uh, lifestyle. I'm going to go back to just taking care of my practices at home. <laughs> I want my blinders back on. <laughs> I can't untake the red pill. You know, it's, it's funny, the blue and red pills that are brought up in that movie, The Matrix, as many good points as that movie hit with 
all the different senses and stuff. Is it really real because you can taste it, you can smell it, you can feel it, or is it just a hologram? It, you know, you've got this holographic universe theory, theory, quantum physics, quantum entanglement. They can't really find a finite source. Everything breaks down to frequencies. Well, but one of the things, though, in that movie is if you know much about what the color red represents and the color blue, you can go all the way back to the beginning of time, and these vibrations, these colors represent certain aspects of life, you know, whether you're, you know, aggressive or relaxed, whether you're, you know, hot or cold, just this yin yang. And it should actually be the blue pill for waking up, not the red pill. Yeah, you know, it's funny how um, different people perceive different things. And when I was learning about Reiki, the, there's different uh, chakras that have different colors. And so in one modality, it's, it's, uh, it's one color. But whenever I met a psychic that wasn't taught in a traditional um, setting and anything traditional about energy healing. She had her own way of looking at things. She saw colors that meant a totally different thing to her. And so it's all about reference point. So it's funny you say that and it's something I learned along the way because I was so you know, like, well, everybody knows that this chakra, the red is the root chakra when it really, you know, this, the, I'll just give you the, a quick experience. I walked into this lady, she was a psychic and walked into her house and right away as soon as I walked in there I wasn't grimacing I wasn't doing anything she looked at me and she goes oh wow do you have a migraine and I looked at her like how in the I just walked in the door and I said yeah how did you know that she goes well you you have yellow around the your head around your crown and when I see that it tells me that you that people have a migraine or severe pain in their head and she was like spot on I like I couldn't even believe it did she help you out well she wasn't there for the migraine thing, obviously. She was there to give me information. And at the time, um, everything she said was, was pretty much spot on. I don't exactly remember what that was in my life that was really early on. But I do remember uh, an instance where my friend and I, he was a, an MD. He had an experience in Bradford, PA, where this psychic walked in. and Well, actually, he walked in to check on a patient of his uh, who had a heart attack. And his wife was there, who was a psychic. And he walked in, and this lady started telling him who... He, she, he had a father figure next to him and described him to a T, and here was his grandfather. And he, he didn't believe her at first, of course. you know He was just like, yeah, or whatever. And then he said, oh, and you have a little dog. I don't know what the dog's name was, a beagle or something. His name was Peanuts. He, she even gave him the name. And he appreciated when you died, or when he died, you buried him and you said these words to him. Well, no one was there when he was 12 years old or however old he was whenever he buried that dog. And how the heck she ever knew his, the dog's name and what? He said to the dog, I mean, he was sold on this lady, like, oh, my God, wow, this, this is for real. I can't even believe this. And so fast forward a couple of years, he knows I'm into doing all this research, and, and him and I take a ride to Bradford, PA, just to, to get an experience. And uh, the, there was a Reiki master there and the, the psychic that we actually went to see. And, and you know, I went in and, uh, let's see, I forget who went first. I think I went and got the energy healing first, and he went into the, the psychic, and then we switched. And that was my first experience with Reiki, and I thought, how in the heck can I, this lady put her hands on my chest, and it felt like she took two irons and stuck them on my chest. I was like, how in the heck is she doing that? And so later on, when I asked her, I was like, all right, well, I want to do this. How do I become a Reiki master? And so that's intrigued me so much that I became a Reiki master. And then when I went into the room where the lady who was the psychic, if I this is January, and if I back up a month, my stepdad had just died. And so he came through, and she started out the, 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 the session with me sitting next to her, but I had my head turned because I don't want to give anything away. You know, I was being scientific and stone cold. And she says, a father figure is coming in. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. She says, yeah, he's, he's, he's claiming you like you're his son. And I'm like, nah. She goes, is your dad still alive? I says, yeah, my, my dad's still here. She's like, God, he, he's... Right away, she, she goes, huh, like this, and like she holds her chest. She goes, okay, honey, take it away, take it away. She's like, he had an impact. Like, like, and I, right away, I started bawling. Like, like, my stepdad had just died, and I was really close to this man. And like a month before, and I turned my head like I didn't want to give it up. And I was like, all right, fine, yes. He was, he, he was walking across the street. He was on, on a storm break. He was a lineman, and a car come up over the hill, and it just hit him. And just, just she said, one minute, before I even said it, she says, one minute he's in his body and then, like in an instant he's confused he's like where the hell like he's out of his body and so that's exactly what happened to this guy she told me so much that was so accurate that no one could have known so uh i was a, a you know that was a, i was a true believer in psychics and all this at that point i mean 
you know, I was a little skeptical, kind of like the Nibiru thing. I'm on the fence. I don't want to be misled. And so I'm doing my own research to see if I can prove or disprove the situation, you know, and what's going on. But yeah, man, psychics, uh, some of them are, are, are dead on. And, you know, I've experienced some that just weren't. Hey. <laughs> hey, you there? Yeah, that was interesting. Weird. <laughs> so it's funny because earlier today when I was doing that interview with Mike Norris and this movie he just released, it's called Amerigeddon, and it's, it's very controversial topics, you know, about U.N. troops rounding up Americans and putting them in FEMA camps and taking away their constitutional rights and stuff. Well, wow. anyway, yeah, I mean, it's really intense. And so make a long story short, we're about three quarters of the way through the show, and, I'll, and he's calling me on a landline. And all of a sudden, just flat out, not only does he get disconnected from me, but the power goes out um, for my Wi-Fi. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, they got us both at the same time. It was like, whoa. So we had to get back on, and whether that was the same thing this time or it was just a, you know, the, the little gremlins inside of the computer, who knows what happened, but glad that yeah. we, glad we got you back on. Um, do, you, do you want to pull that screen back up that we were looking at, that presentation? I mean, even NASA came out multiple times and saying they found this planet at the edge of the solar system. One in 2005 where they said they found this planet on the fringes, they call it, of our solar system, and you can just Google that. Right. So, you know, Caltech University, people coming out saying that they found uh, this body in between, you know, this planet in between Jupiter and Saturn. So who knows? You know, whether I think also that this could be this real wag the dog scenario, keep people wound up on something that might not have a lot of effects. Even if there is a planet X out there, I don't right. think it's going to be the end of the world at all. Right. I think we're going right. to thrive. Yeah. You know, I, that thing that happened in Japan, um, Fukushima, ooh. Well, that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, that's like ridiculous. But there's something that happened there that they had. Uh, um, I think there was a a mudslide and something else going on there too. And it's it's it just shows you all these things that are going on in the world right now. And it's a cause and effect, but we don't know what the cause is. So of course Nibiru is getting blamed, but it could be that the Earth is shifting. It could be that the Earth is expanding. We don't know exactly, but we also, which I get into in my lecture about the. Uh, um, the core samples and different things like that, that, that we have proof that the earth has changed. When I was in New Mexico, I was standing on dry land, you can, and it even tells you right there that it used to be a seabed. And you can see the fossilized uh, uh, remains, and there was actually dinosaur tracks. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's incredible. New Mexico's amazing. I've uh, always been just fascinated with the different types of, you know, not just cultures that are out there and the history behind it, but just the landscape's beautiful also. Santa Fe's a really cool area, the Badlands. Dulce's nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been up there too. Now, you've been to Dulce also? Yep, yep. Great people out there. I actually got somebody to take me up the uh, Archuleta Mesa. Yeah, I went up there myself. I probably shouldn't have. There was no <laughs> signs that said, like, it didn't say no private property. Don't. It was just a road, and I just kept going. I'm like, until I got to the point where I was getting paranoid, and I'm seeing all these antennas out of the mountain, I'm like, oh, my God, I Am I going to get locked up? I mean, is it really worth your your sense of being, you know, comes, you're like, is this sensible? Should I be doing this? Right. I like your style, man. Let's, you know, you're just, <laughs> you're like just that curious cat where you want to know so bad. And you're like, well, I don't see any signs, you know. Right. <laughs> exactly. Let's just go a hundred more feet, man. Just a hundred more feet. Now it's interesting because we actually, the person that took us up there lives out there and he, you know, we could have gone to the very top, but it got to the point to where we didn't have a spare tire that was really worth anything. Even though we did have four wheel drive, or we do have four wheel drive and like, well, maybe we better turn around and, and come back out here next year and, and spend a weekend up at the top there with cert, with the right gear. You know, I mean, it'd be good to have this cert. It was kind of like one of those weird synchronicities, the way that we ended up out there, because I had to go to a funeral in uh, Utah last Labor Day, or, you know, it was like August 31st is when we went out there. And on the way back, the holidays, nothing was available. The only thing that was available was that little casino out there in Dulce, New Mexico, in yeah. the Four Corners area. <laughs> been, been there, yep. Yeah, so it was, it was, pretty, uh, it was pretty fascinating. But do you ever take your—you've got, what, a Cessna? Plane? Oh, I have a Comanche 260. Uh, so it's it's pretty fast. It goes 160 knots, which is about 190 miles per hour. It goes pretty quick. So have you ever put GoPros and stuff or attached certain things on there and, and thought about getting, I don't know, certain footage that might be difficult to get on the ground? That Yes, I've thought about it. I haven't done it yet. So I moved from New Mexico to Pencil back to Pennsylvania here last uh, May. It was the end of... Uh, uh, April actually, and I had started a new job here in Pennsylvania May 1st. So it was a huge transition. To I was out there for three years exploring all of New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, Oklahoma, Texas, all of that. I bought a little RV just to go do all that stuff. And then, you know, my family's back here, so I moved back home, took a job here, was back here from May 1st. And the weather here in the Northeast isn't like out there. You can't, it, you know, 
if you don't have an IFR rating, which I'm working on, I don't have it yet, instrument rating, you can't go every day, you know, and, and the weather just won't allow you to go. So, and plus I started a new job and all this, so I just haven't had time to really get up there. But every time I do, I'm like, God, I need to get a GoPro for up here. I could be catching these chemtrails. I could be up there, you know, heading towards the sun. I could be looking at the ground, all kind of different things I could be doing. Yeah, I, trust me. Yeah, I, it's in, it's in the works. It's just when I get some time to do it. Sure. We would so love to show that footage, too, here on the Lee Project. I mean, that would just be awesome, seeing what you're looking at out there. I like this uh, channel, WSO, Wormwood System Observations, with Steve Olson, because he's got these miniature weather balloons. They're legal. I think he said they were 300 grams or something like that, whatever the most you can do legally. He'll shoot them up into the atmosphere, 80,000, 90,000 feet, with these cameras connected to them. And this one footage he had the other day, he picked up this UFO that literally just started, it got really close and it kind of took off. You could see this weird thing. It was, it was pretty yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I follow him. In fact, I was started to communicate with him and I sent him a few pictures, which one of them I did a screenshot of just to show you that the original uh, picture came from me and he posted it and he told me in the email, which I could you know, screenshot that, that do you get the prize for today? Because he did a, I don't know how to do these things. I'm not that technologically advanced as far as an inversion or something like that of whatever it was to just to see if it was a, a lens flare or not. But he took my picture and, you know, I, I put it out there just for anybody to use. But, you know, it just feels good when someone will recognize, oh, by the way, I got this picture from. And he don't do that. I've been following his channel for a while. And he'll say, oh, a subscriber gave me this. or I mean, it would be nice to give people the recognition for, you know, what, what they've captured in that. Absolutely. And, you know, I think with Steve, he's just got so much stuff going on that he is probably having a tough time putting all that together. And I agree with you. You should give somebody credit for a picture they come up with. I certainly do my best if, uh, if I get footage or film to, that I'm going to do a sp specific podcast. I have that person's name. And if they don't want their full name given, then I'll just do whatever they ask me to. You right, know? right. So, you know, that was really cool because like today when we were communicating, you were sending me some footage and I didn't realize that it was you that was sending me the emails because, you know, we had this interview today. And so yeah. I asked, hey, man, I want to use this footage if you don't mind. Thanks for sending me it out. And he said, well, let's talk about it first. And I said, wait, I think we've got an interview later today. So, um, <laughs> yeah, man, I'm just so glad that you reached out to me, Joseph. You've just got amazing energy. And I really appreciate people like you that do have resources and abilities to go out there and do these kind of things. You're a truth seeker and you've got a good soul, a good heart, and you're also in a position where you can help so many other people. Now, I guess this is, I hope that I'm not putting you on the spot here, but what do you think about vaccines like the swine flu vaccine as an example? Oh boy. And, and so because of my own belief systems, uh, I actually had the, to have my friend Terry channel an answer for that particular question a few years ago. And the answer was that it depends on the person's belief system. Because we are these powerful co-creators of this thing called reality or life here on this planet. And what you believe in is what you create. And so if you believe that the flu shot will work for you, regardless of which flu shot it is, then it's going to work for you. And hmm, how should I say that? Let me preface that with, with also <laughs> saying that you know, there's a lot of material that's coming out and a lot of other uh, providers, doctors that are coming out saying that, hey, what is in this? What are in what is actually in the injections that is actually potentially causing things like autism and other things? Um, and so I, I, I really have to be cautious whenever I say certain things about this because, you know, it is in my daily practice. My opinion is, well, let me put it to you this way. I won't get one. I won't suggest my family get any. And so you know, you can take what you want out of that. But if a person comes in, the first thing I ask them is like, are you going to get your flu shot? And they say, well, I don't know. What do you think? I says, well, you need to take responsibility for your own health care. What do you think? Do you think, they're, do you think they're, they're good for you? Do you think they're safe? Do you think they help you? And depending on their opinion, some of them, I couldn't even talk out of it if I wanted to. Some of them will come in and say, hey, every time I get that flu shot, I don't get the flu. Other people say, every time I get that flu shot, I get the flu symptoms. And, and they say that's an, attenua an attenuated virus or a dead virus that it shouldn't get, I shouldn't get sick, but yet I do. And so I let them make their decision on their own. My, own, my patients, they get to de decide. I don't tell them what to do. I say, look, what do you want to do? And a lot of it has to come down to a belief system. And the other part of it, you know, it has to do with where a person's vibrating at. And so this gets into some of the other stuff we didn't get to talk about today, but it's all in a person's consciousness. It's in how they vibrate. It's what foods they're eating, how healthy they are. Are they, you know, do they 
look at themselves as, hey, I have to go to the gym to stay healthy. And therefore, they go to the gym, they're healthy because that's their belief system. I have to take vitamins every day or I get sick. They, that's their belief system. So a lot of this has to do with belief. Now, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because I have talked to people that say they get the flu shot every year and they're fine. And I'm thinking to myself, man, why would you do that? You know, because you'd have to literally put a gun to my head and pull the trigger before I would let somebody inject me with another one of those vaccines. Um, but it's just, it blows my mind how some people can take one every year and they're just fine. And then I know people that have been, you know, they got shot with that flu vaccine and then they immediately break out in these weird hives and they've got these weird neurological issues and problems. And then you could say, well, some of the vaccines have these thimerosals or these specific adjuvants or squalene or something that causes specific reactions with the immune system. And because of their DNA and where they're at, it's going to cause a specific reaction where 90% of the people will be fine and 10% won't. But like you said, that could be a, a big key to somebody's health or dis-ease is their own personal beliefs and where they are at vibrational, you know, their vibrational frequency. Like this guy I know named Jack, just he's about 80 years old now and he's lived the life of a rock star his entire life. I used to, to work with him. I told you a little bit about my position with that company. And I mean, you could write an entire 10 season series about his life and what he's done. And he's, he talks, you know, he's, he goes through surgeries where they pull stuff off of his brain and back surgeries. And he's still getting up, doing his thing and, and, you know, drinking and smoking and, and have it. He's a, he's kind of like Hugh Hefner. He likes the ladies still at that age and, you know, just crazy. And then there's other people out there that they'll get back surgery once or just because of where their mindset is, it destroys them or cripples them or something. I wonder why is it some people can just get through life and go through surgeries and doctors and never have any problems really once they get taken care of or fixed up. And then there's those other people that have the exact opposite effects. Could it have to do with just where they're at mentally? Um, so you know what? I think the next time we get together, we're going to talk about all of this stuff because um, bridging the gap, the the uh, the talk that that we intended to do tonight. We kind of got sidetracked because there's so much information that I want to get out to you. So I'm sorry, but I went off on all kind of tangents tonight. But if we do a part two to this, then I'm going to answer that question and many more because really the bridging the gap, it pulls all this information together and it makes sense of um, why things are the way they are. What is the truth? And so it's for each individual person to find out what their particular truth is. As I go through this, you know, somebody's truth might be a little bit different. And my truth is different today than it was last week, than it was a year ago. And so it changes as you're open to the possibilities of mm, what's available out there, um, you know, raising in vibration. There's so many. The, the biggest thing is being open. I mean, if you're open-minded and you're researching, uh, if, you're, if you're open enough to, to be out there looking and just say, what if, you're going to find the answers that mean the most to you in your situation. And you got to remember, like, Oh gosh, I'm getting ahead of myself here because this is in the talk, but you know, the way I look at life on this planet right now is we came in here with a predestined plan that we created ourselves. And so the life is but a stage, right? Oh yeah. So whoever said that, I can't remember who who that was, whether it be Shakespeare or who, but but it, that's how I look at it. I really look at we are in a play. We're in a performance right now. We've forgotten why we've why we've come here, we're actors on a stage, the ETs or the archangels or whoever, our higher selves, however you want to look at it, are in the audience. They're watching us. Because we've self-imposed amnesia on us, when the curtain goes up, we're playing out this part. Some of us are playing the good guys, some are playing the bad guys. And so what happens is, once the play is over and, and is completed, all of a sudden we have this epiphany of remembrance of who we truly are. So we've self-imposed this uh, amnesia on ourselves. So we are here just to play out this part for the purpose of an experience. I really think that's what it's all about. And so when the play is done, the bad guys are actually your best friends. We, we just have forgotten it. And so it's really difficult for people to get behind because at a lower vibrational understanding, they're thinking, well, that SOB, they committed murder and suicide. And, you know, you know who, anybody that commits suicide, why, that's a, that's a mortal sin, so they should go to hell. And those who commit murder, that's another sin. And they, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of things we've been taught, and a lot of things are things I wouldn't recommend, obviously. I'm not going to recommend someone go out and commit suicide or murder or anything like that. This is a lower vibrational thing. But it's all in how you look at it. When you stand at these higher vibrations, when you step into, say, fifth dimension or above, it's all unconditional love. There, there's no conditions. There's no judgment. They just look upon us, or we as our higher selves look upon ourselves 
as though we are playing out a game. It, that's all it is. Yeah. I've used that statement many times also. The, uh, it was supposedly Shakespeare that said that, according to the history books, but you know, who knows? There's probably somebody that said it before him as well. And you're right. right, man. The whole world is a stage, and I look at the politicians out there and what they're doing. I mean, they're the biggest actors of them all, but certainly this cosmic reality, this holographic matrix that we're in, it sure is exciting. And once we realize our purpose and find the flow, that's the key is to find the flow, folks. Get your purpose, stick with it, whatever that is. And you'll know when you find it because things will just happen for you. Opportunities will present themselves. And it's just almost as if the universe is perfectly aligned when you're in tune with it. So I certainly appreciate you coming on the show with us, Joseph. It's just been great to speak with you, and we will definitely do this again soon. I'll have some, uh, you know, I'll have Kristen send out some times to to put a, a part two together. And thanks for everything. Hey, thank you so much for uh, allowing me the opportunity and the platform to speak about all this information that I've gathered and garnered from other people. A lot of the wisdom that I got is not from me. I have to give thanks also to the individuals that I've interviewed, uh, the 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 individuals who we've channeled over the years. I mean, I'm just a messenger. I'm just a communicator. So, you know, and thank you for, again, for being the platform for myself and other people to, 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 to speak and to kind of pull all this information together so that, uh, you know, the humanity, all of us have an opportunity to raise an awareness that we otherwise wouldn't get. I mean, the mainstream media doesn't talk about any of this stuff. You don't learn it in school. Um, even continuing ed education, you have to do the research on your own, and and that's really the pitfall. When people think that the government won't lie to us, uh, if I go for this particular degree, I'm going to get the truth. The histories that we've been taught are all the truth. All of this stuff is inversion, and so when you start to ask questions about everything, uh, as far as why, why is that the way it is? That doesn't make sense, and you start to research it. That's where you get the answer. So my advice would be open, being open-minded, and uh, again, I thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to come on. Absolutely. Also, I'd like to thank our audience. Folks, check out our new website. It is absolutely cutting edge, leakproject.com. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to become a member with us, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Get access to all the latest podcasts first and free. And I also wanted to thank beforeitsnews.com. There's just a ton of information on there, independent reporters from all over the world, everything from you know current events, politics, Anything under the sun, you name it, is there. And they've been featuring a lot of our shows there with the League Project. So thank you guys. Folks, stay safe and be the change you want to see. This is Rex Bear. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Baer, and tonight we've got guest Dr. Mara with us, a doctor of nursing practice and has had an established career in Altoona, Pennsylvania at a location called the Urgent Care Center until July of 30th, 2011. Now, practicing traditional medicine in conjunction with the more holistic approaches, Dr. Mara is also a hypnotherapist Reiki master, intuitive healer, and spiritual counselor. Basically, he offers a full range of health care and addressing most health concerns, also made it his mission to be of service to all in all areas of body, mind, spirit, which translates to health in its wholeness or holistic health care. Now, we're going to get into a multitude of topics, folks, tonight here at The Leak Project, but one of the first things we're going to discuss is you can probably see this anomaly on the screen here to the top left of the sun. And this video that I'm going to play for you guys here in just a moment is going to make it clearly look like there is a planet X or second sun there. But before we get into that, I first off just want to thank you so much for joining us, Joseph, here at The Leak Project. How the heck are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. It's certainly an honor to speak with you. You've been all over the world in different conferences. I mean, you've just had an amazing life so far, and you're going to do things even more incredible than you have already. So, but what I was hoping we could do first is jump into this video, and I'm going to play it in the background here. Before I do that, just tell us a quick bit about yourself, and then we're going to jump into this video. Okay, well, you know, as you said, I'm a uh... Uh, my name is Dr. Mara, and I owned uh, and uh, built three urgent care centers. So I practice family medicine. I'm boarded in family medicine. Um, uh, briefly, I also uh, became a hypnotherapist, uh, a Reiki master. I'm also attuned in Sakem Sakem and Moon Aiki, different energy healing modalities. 
and uh, I always wondered how I could do both because you know doing traditional medicine it, you know you're only given maybe five to ten maybe fifteen minutes with a patient and it takes somewhere between a half an hour to an hour to really get in and, and do some quality work with hypnotherapy or energy healing and so um, what I did was I opened my own practices and half of the building was set up so that the patients had a choice they could either do traditional medicine or they could do um, what we call alternative or complementary medicine today and uh, that included hypnotherapy and energy healing and uh, I also referred people for uh, herbal treatments and things like that uh, at a local naturopath but um, basically in a nutshell I, I tried to offer my patients uh, more than just the traditional medicine or what we call traditional medicine today that's great. I talked to Dr. Len Saputo earlier today, and one of the things I really like about his approach is he takes, he's out there in California, San Francisco Bay Area, and he takes the West, the best of the Western medicine, Eastern cultures, and other type of, you know, opportunities to help his patients, and he'll spend an hour or so with them at least just to get to know what's going on in their lives, not just this five, ten minutes, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, have a wonderful day type scenario. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And, and unfortunately, the way the insurance companies, they tailor your time and they pay f so much a visit. And, you know, when you go into to medicine, you think you're there to help the patient. And, I, you know, ultimately you are, but you are limited with things such as time and reimbursement. Because if you're not bringing in enough money to pay for the employees and the lights and everything else, uh, you're not going to be there next week to continue helping them. And so uh, insurances have a lot to do with... Uh, the way uh, practitioners provide care for their patients these days. Absolutely. Now, if we could, let's jump into this first video that you sent. Uh, that's about 26 seconds here. And if you could just describe, as I push play here, the, the scenario and the situation. Yeah, so I'm at uh, Lake Glendale in uh, central Pennsylvania. And you can see um, up in the left-hand uh, corner, and, and if you play the audio of it, later or whatever. I don't know if it's on there right now, but you can hear me saying that there's something up in at the uh, uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock position. And so as you're capturing it in real time, you can see that. And so what I also did was I'm looking through my phone and what I did was I tore apart one of those uh, floppy disks and uh, it has a film there, which uh, it kind of cuts the glare away so that you can actually look towards the sun and see what's around it or uh, within it. And, you know, when I first saw this, I was like sold. I thought, oh my gosh, I captured Planet X. It's here. It's the real deal. I'm actually spinning my phone around so you can see the lens flare that's around there. And so um, after I caught this footage, I had to leave the lake for like five minutes and came back. I was so excited. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get the the uh, reflection off the water just like you see there in the sun. We're going to see the second sun with the reflection just like you see on some of these other videos and photos. And what happened was I put this... Um, I guess it's iron oxide or magnetic it's a magnetic disc that you that when you break apart these um, floppy disks and if you have it a certain distance away from the camera and this was my iPhone 6 that I was capturing this on what it does is it creates a second sun and even though you're spinning it around to see where the lens flare is it actually created and the reason I know this is because when I put it up a second time it was at the two o'clock position at this point and I thought wait a minute so I, re I moved it around a little bit again and I got the the 11 o'clock position again and I thought, oh my gosh, this thing is just creating it. And so I, it would take further research, I'm sure, to see exactly. But that confirmed to me that not everything that we see that's out there on the Internet is, I think, really, I think people actually think they're capturing things that really aren't there by the tools that they're using. And that, that happened to me personally. That's why I sent that to you is because, you know, not to be a debunker, but I'm neutral on the, on the subject, and I just don't want to – be led down this path blindly. I, I would go out and do my own research. And so if there's people out there that are using welding goggles or that same technique that I was using, like breaking apart the floppy disk, um, you know, I couldn't see this with my naked eye. So that's why when I put that up there, I thought, oh my gosh, there it is. And then it just took a second time of me putting the phone down and picking it back up to actually, it actually disappointed me in a way, but also I was like relieved that, oh wow, okay, wow, that sucks that Planet X isn't really there. But then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm glad Planet X isn't really there. You know what I'm saying? I'd be happy that Planet X isn't there. I mean, yeah, right. At first, you're like, oh, right. I can totally understand that. But, you know, and I've been getting a lot of pictures that are similar to this, where you can see this, what looks like a second sun to the top left or to the bottom. And I guess it's just some type of, 
lens anomaly. And I'm going to go here for now. I want to just change the screen and show some sun dogs and stuff like that because we have been getting a lot of images here at the leak project where you've got people with the best intentions. And I really hope you guys keep sending us the photos, but I just want to show you guys what photos you don't need to send me because they are lens flares or sun dogs or anomalies. Now, this one, as you can see right here, this is definitely a sun dog. And it seems like there's some type of you know light source to the left and right. Well, this is a sun dog. You can look it up. And then here's another sun dog you can see where it looks like there's this other light source to the left but that's just a reflection from the sun and all the stuff that's being sprayed in the atmosphere all these chemtrails which we're going to talk about here in a little bit and also your expertise because you do fly planes and you've got your own personal plane and you know what the difference is between a contrail and a chemtrail but there's a lot of these anomalies these lens flares and reflections that people think are definitely uh, planet x that i want to show you guys as well because it almost looks like the wing destroyer old icons and logos and stuff that people have seen for many years. So what do you think the best way to debunk all of this stuff would be for you, Joseph? I mean, if you just wanted to, you know, say, would you recommend people do that, what you did with the iron oxide, breaking open a floppy disk or something like that and doing the same thing? Well, you know, this is difficult because it's not just about that. You're seeing people with uh, better cameras than the iPhone 6. You're seeing people with... Uh, uh, cameras that have ultraviolet uh, capabilities or infrared capabilities for picking uh, light that we can't see up with the naked eye. And so I've seen some of those pictures that are quite compelling. You see the not only the webcams, uh, you see the satellite cams that are out there in space. Um, you know, there's so much, and people are adding all kinds of other things to it, like these underground bunkers that are built. I mean, these are all realities. It's a matter of the cause and effect and what makes sense. And so when you start to research everything, you're like, hmm, Okay, I can get behind some of this, but is that the actual truth? Because going and sifting through the muddy water that's been put out uh, all around us is pretty difficult. So my, my best thing, my best uh, suggestion would be get out and do some of your own research. Uh, don't believe just because one person says it or just a couple people say it. And on the other hand, I'm saying be open-minded because like, like I said, you know, I've witnessed so many things uh, over my lifetime that some people still don't believe, but I'm a true believer because I've personally witnessed and experienced it. So the moment I witness uh, Planet X, I, I can tell you right now I'll be a true believer. But until then, um, I'm not saying I don't believe in it. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm totally open-minded to it and I'm, you know, time will tell. Let's just put it that way. Certainly. Now, this picture that we're looking at right here, this is in your own plane, and you're actually flying over the Rockies? Yeah, I was uh, taking my plane up into Colorado there. I had to get a new uh, DG put in it, uh, which is a, a directional gyro, and it, uh, it helps you uh, navigate, I guess you could say. And so w instead of just watching the compass the, the entire time, you, uh, you know, basically you tune in your DG. What's, what's funny, though, is I had to get a new DG, and just flying my plane recently, it keeps, uh, hmm, it's not, how should I put it? I have to change it quite often. And so when you're seeing some of these videos of people talking about the magnetics of the earth changing, as I'm flying, I can tell you just from a few years ago till now, um, how, how this has changed in my own plane. And I got a new DG because of it, but, uh, you know, there's there's something going on with the magnetics of the Earth, and that's I'm not going to go into detail about it. People can do their own research, but it appears to me that it is. It is, is in fact, changing. You know, the other day I was watching this plane just blast the skies with chemicals, and I was with a friend of mine that's, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. He's, he's well-educated, has a good position in life, you know, not only with just who he is as a person, but also what people would consider a career. And we, we started talking about chemtrails because I was watching this plane just blast the skies and you could tell what sections of the skies were. You know, they had these clouds that were formed from chemtrails. They're not your typical clouds. They've got this weird haze and, and kind of like reflective pattern to them. And at first he was kind of skeptical. He was like, no, you know, those are, those are just chemtrails.